Welcome to the Let the Stray Show, your one-stop destination for intriguing conversations with extraordinary individuals who are boldly navigating life outside the conventional norms. Our host, Scott Fullerton, is thrilled to embark on this journey of discovery with all of you. The Left a Straight Show, we believe that every person's story is unique, and it's our mission to showcase the diversity of human experiences. We bring you the untold stories of fascinating people who identify as LGBT plus and allies, pushing boundaries, breaking stereotypes, and making a positive impact in our communities. On this show, we bring you a diverse lineup of inspiring guests, from activists to artists, and entrepreneurs to entertainers, and everything in between. We dive deep into their personal journeys, discovering the pivotal moment that has shaped their lives and careers. You can expect thought-provoking discussions on a wide range of topics, from LGBTQ rights, social justice to arts, culture, mental health, and more. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Left of Straight Show interviews. I'm your host, as always, Scott Fullerton, and I'm proud to be able to interview amazing celebrities and personalities, all from the worlds of entertainment, foodies, books, music, and advocacy, all for our LGBTQ community and fantastic straight allies. I'm excited today to dive into the stories of inspiring LGBTQ entrepreneurs and adventurers. Kaysen Crane is with me in studio today. So thrilled to have Kaysen, who's a dynamic and innovative figure that's made significant strides both in business and in adventure. From a very young age, Kaysen has been on a remarkable journey of entrepreneurship and endurance. He climbed his first mountain as a freshman in high school and went on to scale all of the seven summits, which are the highest mountains on each continent. He's the first openly gay mountain climber to do so and did it all in just five years. He's also the founder of Explorer Cold Brew, and you know how much I love myself a good coffee. It's the world's first premium cold brew coffee company, offering a unique choice in caffeine levels. We got so much to talk about, and I'm excited to share a story with you. So in just a moment, welcome to the Left of Straight Show for the very first time, Mr. Case and Crane. But first, take a look. We are back, and with me in studio right now, Mr. Kaysen Crane. Kaysen, how the heck are you, dude? Hey, Scott. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. It's uh, just, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, so I'm a little bit, I'm a little stuffed from uh, lots of turkey, and uh, but it's, it's, I'm happy to be here chatting today. There you go. I'm excited to have you. As I told you off air, I think you're a freaking rock star. You've done some amazing things. <laughs> going to be a fun interview. And you and I bookend December. We're in the holiday month. Your birthday is the second day of December. Mine's the day before the last day of December, December 30th. So happy birthday, my friend. You too. You too. There yeah. You I love birthdays. I feel like, oh. you know, a lot of people, especially as as we get older, you know, when you're a kid, you celebrate your birthday every year. But then as you get older, sometimes you get sort of a weird feeling about it. But I love birthdays. I think it's so fun. We should be celebrating each other every day if we could there you go see i am the opposite of that i because of my <laughs> birthday is december 30th i'm i was always in christmas vacation so we know that never celebrated it at school and then it's like five days after christmas two days before new year's where y'all plan a new year so i just plus i'm old as dirt so i forget about my birthday half the time just for that so. <laughs> yeah you should but celebrate your your half birthday your half there birthday. you go and i love to celebrate other people's birthdays so i do enjoy that but Maybe a half birthday. I like that idea. Good call yeah. on that. Well, let's start from the very beginning. All of my newbies here on the Left of Straight Show, I always ask two questions. The first is, tell me about where you grew up and what kind of a kid were you growing up? I grew up in uh, Lawrenceville, New Jersey, which is a little town about an hour north of Philadelphia, an hour south of New York City. So very conveniently located between two big cities, but 
you know, not at all, not at all a city environment. And I was a very studious kid. I was very athletic, uh, but I worked really hard in school. I was very lucky to have parents that, well, they, I'm the oldest of five kids and they pushed all of us really hard. Uh, it was, you know, whether it was in sports or in school or other hobbies. I mean, my, my mother was having me tutored in Arabic at age, uh, like at age 10. So uh, that's the sort of upbringing I had. And I was so lucky to have that because I had a lot of opportunities to travel, to learn new things, to push myself. Uh, and when I was a kid, I didn't really, it wasn't optional, you know, like it, it, I had to do those things. Um, and I look back and I'm very grateful to my parents for forcing me to do everything they did um, because it shaped who I am today. And I came out when I was 14. So uh, I had very supportive parents who immediately embraced me uh, after coming out. I think that their immediate reaction was that they knew, I think they said, my dad said something like, yeah, I've known since you were about six months old. Uh, <laughs> there was just something. Um, maybe it was the brightly colored capris when I was in middle school, or yeah. I don't know. Um, right? I, I wasn't exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I had a wonderful, wonderful childhood. I love that. And that leads right to my second question. The second question I usually ask is, when did you first kind of come out to yourself? And when do you felt you find your, started finding your LGBTQ tribe? So you came out publicly at 14. When did you kind of come out to yourself? And where do you think you started finding an LGBTQ tribe? Oh, gosh. I mean, Scott, I, I, I came out at 14, uh, freshman year of high school. But really, I had been talking about boys somewhat publicly since <laughs> like age 11. Um, not in a, just in sort of a, you know, in the silly, like middle school crush way. Right. And I never really thought about coming out as I think most other people uh, in, in our generation did where, you know, it was a choice. It was a step. It was like a conversation. It was for me, I, I honestly didn't think of it even as a, as a choice. Cause I, I don't know. I, the idea of hiding once I fully realized and accepted it, I, I, I couldn't really fathom the idea of hiding it. And part of that is the, the privilege of having the, the security and comfort of, of really knowing my parents would accept me no matter what. And uh, in terms of finding my tribe, when I fully came out freshman year of high school, there was only one other openly LGBT student at my high school who was a senior when I was a freshman. And he and I did not have a lot in common. We weren't, you know, it's not like we became best buds. And it took a while. It took, a, it took I mean, it really, it was quite rare at that time to, to come out that young. And so my first tribe, uh, I would say my first tribe that I found, you know, my, my like chosen family, so to speak, uh, before I found my queer chosen family was, was my cross country team. Even though they were all straight, at least at the time, they were the people that felt like this, this, this group of friends that are more than friends that are the people there who have your back. And, and I think, you know, while I wish I'd had a, uh, a, tri a queer tribe freshman year of high school, I, I, it, it just didn't exist. And so um, I'm really grateful to have had such amazing friends and friendships there. And then as I, I think, I guess by the time I went to college, when I went to college, then I definitely started finding my, my tribe, my queer tribe um, to complement the other amazing people in my life. And, uh, and now I, I feel like my favorite, well, not exclusively, but I've got ama amazing queer friends. And I have to say, like, I, queer, being queer is just the best thing in the world. It's like, it's such a blessing. And it took so many years to come to a point where I actually recognized being gay as, as a blessing. I mean, I, I was always fine. You know, I was fine with it. Right. But now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm not straight. <laughs> or as crazy as that is. No, and it's I say it all the time because I consider myself a bear of a certain age. And unfortunately, our generation didn't feel that, right? We didn't have that comfort. And But once you 
you do finally accept that and come out at whatever age you look back and like, oh, I wish because, yeah, you find out how special it is and everything opens up all of a sudden and you get that feeling, right? So I'm so excited that you found that at an early age. And that's something we need to teach our younger people. And we have to get our elders to to just accept it and to understand it. Yeah, it, it, you, it's a really good time out there. And well, I, I think on the, 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 we're lucky in the career community that because our childhoods can feel very isolating, I think we do seek out that tribe as we get older of the tribe of other queer people. But I, I feel like in today's day and age with social media and the proliferation of technology that in some ways brings people closer together, regardless of their physical distance. You know, you can FaceTime someone, you can be friends on Instagram, even having ever met, that's all relatively new. But, you know, my husband and I are involved with the LGBT center in New York. And it's interesting how that used to be such a core focal point of the queer community in New York City, and now still is an incredibly important part of the queer culture and fabric. But it feels like the the role it plays in our community and, you know, the services it provides, which are incredible life-saving services, it's shifted. It's it's less about just being a community center and more about providing the healthcare services, the legal services, the uh, mental health services, the uh, drug uh, and alcohol addiction services that are literally saving people's lives. So still extremely important, but I, I do wonder sometimes like how – how can we do a better job as a queer community of fostering fostering those tribes in a way that is healthy and and right. and allows people of different generations and experiences to come together and meet and share like i i think i i wish there were more of that or i wish that were more easily accessible Exactly. And, and as you said, it's great to have that resource center. We still need the resource centers. We we'll still need to teach LGBTQ history. We still need to have those legal defenses, especially as the pendulum starts swinging back the other way. We had a couple of really great oh, years, yeah. a couple of really bad years now. So you need to have those resource centers. But you're right. Community can be found in a lot of different ways now, which is pretty exciting. So that's great. Yeah. But and I think about like we my. Uh, my husband friend and I did the Northeast AIDS ride for the LGBT Center of New York this year from Boston to New York. We did it last year too. It's such an amazing event. They just opened registration for next year. So if 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 you or, or anyone listening is a cyclist or not, or just wants to support an amazing uh, event, consider it. And I think one thing that I found so special about the ride is it's it's only three days. But it brings together people of such different ages, backgrounds, professions, et cetera. And there's this common bond, a bond that is partially born out of the, uh, the, ch the physical challenge of the ride, partially born out of the, the very real and, con you know, the pressing issue that HIV and AIDS remains in our community. Um, and part of it is it's sort of hard to put a finger on it. Like, what, why it does this feel so special? Um, and so I, I find that very inspiring and I'm very glad to be a part of it because, uh, it, it you just, you break, it breaks down, it breaks down barriers that we don't even know exist in our communities. You have to have you and your husband back when that happens. I've had AIDS Cycle LA come on quite a few times over the past couple of years, but I haven't really paid attention to the New York one. I should I should really feature that this year because that's a great It's great, so great, great. It's much smaller than the West Coast AIDS life cycle, but it's it's an amazing I mean, it's all they're all great. Exactly. And physical challenge, obviously, I find a lot of I, I bond very easily with people through physical challenge has been a big part of my life. So, uh, but it's not just me, I promise. Well, let's jump into that. I want to talk about the explorer in you for a bit, Case. And I mean, I remember reading that uh, at 18 years old, you were strapped to your dad's back cross country and everything. So talk about the love of this, how it slowly developed, how your parents kind of fostered it. And what really, what was the turning key to you? It's like, now I'm going to start doing it on my own. When did it become a passion for yourself? Well, so yeah, I, I mean, gosh, again, I'm so lucky that my parents, they, they just made this choice when they, I, you know, when they had me, they were like, we're going to, we're going to have kids and we're going to just take them with us. Doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter, you know, whether our, our first child is 18 months old and, you know, we're going to hike with him across Australia or something like that, you know, it's, or cycle across Tasmania. Um, the, that just planted this 
passion for exploring the outdoors. And I think I, when I, I wouldn't say that I, I love doing, I love going on adventures with other people. I think the bonding aspect of pursuing a physical challenge is unparalleled. And even with my siblings and my parents, I still, they're still my go-to adventure buddies. Um, you know, whether it's an ultra marathon in Kazakhstan or an Ironman in Mexico, like they're the first people I call in part because they're also crazy like me and they're more likely to say yes than uh, basically <laughs> anyone else I know. Um, well, and, and my husband and my husband, he does them. I, he's like, he's part of the family now, obviously. Um, he he did not start out start out when we first started dating he was not into these crazy adventures and now he's totally addicted um but i i started going off on my own when i was graduating from high school and i my parents well i think it was this it, you know when you're graduating from high school you've turned 18 you are legally an adult and my parents pushed me to take an opportunity to take this as an opportunity to do something of my own creation. And I personally was very passionate about suicide prevention uh, for a number of reasons, not only because as a gay kid, seeing the tragic deaths of kids like Tyler Clementi, who were only a couple years older than me was, was very traumatizing and, and challenging. I also lost a friend to suicide in high school and I couldn't help but feel, even though I had such an amazing experience growing up, relatively amazing, not perfect, but relatively <laughs> easy, relatively uh, rewarding experience growing up as a gay kid. I, I, I knew just from the, the painful moments of bullying I did experience, I knew how it could be so much worse and was so much worse for people all across the country. And so I knew I wanted to do something for that. And I thought, what could be more powerful than literally climbing the biggest mountains in the world, literally climbing Mount Everest and taking that one step after another approach that growing up as a queer kid, that you need to, you need to learn how to do that in order to make it through. And I just thought this feels so personal and fitting and powerful. And ultimately it wasn't why I did it, but thinking more, you know, as I started pursuing the challenge and realizing I looked for role models. I looked for other queer climbers who had done the seven summits or who had climbed Mount Everest and they didn't exist. And I didn't set out thinking, Oh, I want to set a record or I want, it was more about like, Oh gosh, I want the next LGBT kid to know that, yeah, there's been a pride flag on the summit of Mount Everest. I brought the pride flag to the summit of Everest for the first time in history. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. I think mm -hmm. to me, because I cared about it then, but I, you know, th this was 10 years ago now. Honestly, I, I don't know. I, I feel like if I were to do it now, people would be more enthusiastic about it. I think um, even 10 years ago, there was this, I would get a lot of like, well, being gay isn't a handicap. And I was like, no, it's definitely not a handicap. Like, I think it's a source of strength, actually. <laughs> like, it's, it's the opposite. Um, but there was a lot of misunderstanding or mis misinterpreting why it was important. Um, and I think we've done a better job of understanding that representation matters. Right. Very much so. I agree 100%. And I love that, that, like you said, I think just those accomplishments are great, but it's just, as you said, it's the representation that matters. I mean, it's great to be able to do these things, but having the pride flag on there, being openly and honest about it with everybody, that's, I think, what's really important. And good on you for making sure that that's part of your, um, the way you express it. And I think that's fantastic. And we talk about your family. I mean, it's not just you, your brother. Um, Across the Atlantic Ocean, talk to me about this amazing. Oh what gosh! Wow. Well, so I, as the oldest, you know, I went out um, and pursued the seven summits, climbed the seven summits. But then each of my siblings that were younger than me, they then I think sought to uh, <laughs> make sure they they matched whatever <laughs> I did in their own way, in their own way, obviously. Um, and pursue something that was passion, you know, that they were passionate about. Um, so my brother Oliver 
he rode solo across the Atlantic Ocean. He was the youngest person to row solo across any ocean at the time. I think someone has since done it who's younger. But, I mean, 44 days and 16 hours rowing alone. And this isn't just to be very clear. I'm not talking about sailing. I'm talking about rowing, like physically rowing himself across the Atlantic Ocean. It's crazy. And to give a little glimpse into the the culture of my family, um, as soon as he had finished it, my mother, who really is the 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 original explorer, the original inspiration behind a lot of this. She's got an incredibly inspiring story herself. She was her first state, her first words to Oliver were congratulations and I love you and all that. But then it wasn't too long after that she was she started sort of pulling me aside and saying, "Hmm, so do you think we can do that next year?" <laughs> a little bit of like a a fun competitiveness where. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we love challenges. We love pushing each other. And um, so that's my brother, Oliver, pursued that challenge. My sister, Bella, solo through hiked the Pacific Crest, Pacific Crest Trail along the West Coast from Mexico to Canada. My brother, David, biked across Africa from north to south, um, which is crazy. Many, a very long, uh, many months long cycle race, actually, the Tour de Afrique. Uh, and my youngest brother, actually, he, he decided to, um, his, he wanted to go straight to college. So he, he's in college and that's his choice. And it's, we're all different. Um, yeah. Well, good for him. I think it's just amazing. And then just to add to it, you and, uh, Bella decide to, let's go ahead and trek across, uh, Alaska just for the hell of it. Uh. I mean, I've seen Survivor. I've seen Amazing Race. I've had the Amazing Race uh, Engage couple on a couple weeks ago, and they're a great, great. Um, but, but decide to bear it all in Alaska when it's not like you're staying in hotels and you're not staying on little cement areas where the pit stops are. Talk about this. How do you hear about it? I had never heard about yeah. it. And talk about this adventure. So, yeah, so my sister Bella and I were cast on a reality adventure show, Race to Survive Alaska, which aired this summer. And so we filmed it a summer a summer ago, so about a year and a half ago now. It was crazy. So I got a, a DM on Instagram. A casting person slid into my DMs about two years ago. And, you know, I think that they know how to, how to, how to pique the interest of someone who likes adventures and challenges. It's like... This is like, I'm reaching out because I think that this is, it's the adventure of a lifetime. Uh, you know, do you have five minutes to get on the phone? I think you'd be a perfect fit, whatever. So I get on the phone and I run my own business. I own my own business. I, I run my business full time. That I do not have time to go into the Alaskan wilderness uh, for, I mean, certain, not even, not for weeks, let alone months. Uh, but I decided to, to take. Oh my goodness. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I decided to take the call because I'm curious and. He describes it. And this is the thing that most people don't understand. Show like Amazing Race or show like Survivor, they're in their, you know, 45th season, right, in the case of Survivor. So people know what they're getting themselves into. And if you're being cast in the show, you know you're being cast in the show, you know what the show is. Yes, there's always like little twists or tweaks each season, but fundamentally, you know, the structure of the show, you know, how long it lasts, you know, all those things. In our case from date like we did not know crucial details of the show until the cameras started rolling on day one this is the this is what they don't tell you about being on a first season of a show you go in so blind and ultimately it was a huge risk especially for my sister and i because my sister works in finance i own my coffee company it turns out we were competing mostly against professional athletes now, my sister and I are very fit people, but the difference between a professional athlete and us is like we exercise, like I'll do like Barry's boot camp, uh, like a few times a week and I stay fit or I go for a run outside, but I am not a professional athlete and I'm certainly not a professional survivalist and neither is my sister. And so like, I mean, I live in Brooklyn. I was teaching myself from YouTube videos how to make fire with flint and steel on my roof. I almost burnt my house down. 
Um, and then we get thrust into the Alaskan wilderness, not really knowing, like, we didn't know, are we going to be given food or are we not going to be given food? Turns out we were given almost no food. It was truly like emergency baseline rations only six different times throughout the show. We had no idea how long it was going to last. Turns out we were out in the wilderness for two months. My business, I mean, I, again, I didn't know how long I'd be away. I thought I'd be away like a week or two. Anyway, it was a crazy experience. And the last thing I'll say on the show, I mean, I'll talk about it more, but it was way more real and dangerous than I expected. I thought like, okay, reality shows are like the opposite of reality, right? It's like they're produced, they're edited, they're all this. This was legitimately one of the most dangerous things I've ever done. And it's, if they are making subsequent seasons, I hope that they make it safer for the instance. <laughs> So well, when you're watching Race Around Alaska, it's real. I was surfing around to check it out, and I was watching one clip where you and your sister are watching a helicopter came in. It's like, someone's really seriously hurt, but it's like, it didn't really phase you. It's like, well, that does. Someone's going to get seriously hurt here. So it wasn't like an unexpected deal seeing a helicopter. So I kind and of Scott, that, that, was that was day one. That was day one. Day one, somebody ended up in the ICU. Like, oh it, it was so crazy. So crazy. Um, yeah, so I don't want to spoil too much because, I mean, it's a great show. It's on Peacock if, if folks right. want to watch it. Um, but uh, I think overall, overall, it's one of those moments where, I mean, it was a very long moment. It was two months. But where you do something that's so hard that you think there's no way I could do that. And then you do it. and it makes other challenges in your life, not necessarily physical challenges, emotional challenges, professional challenges. It makes everything feel more doable, not easy. Everything, you know, things are still hard, but when you've persevered through literally starving in the Alaska, I lost 30 pounds and I was 160 pounds to begin with. So I like, it was, I lost a huge percent of my body weight. It, you just feel like, you can take on more. You feel like you can persevere through other challenges. And, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the time I had with my sister because we were close because before. You have but... all these things separate. You've done stuff with your mom, you've done stuff with your dad, but this is bonding with your sister. You guys have these individual accomplishments, but two months with your sister, that'd be kind of special. I would think. Right? Be <laughs> some moments where you it was hard to. <laughs> some moments where you went, wow, I didn't realize she had that in her. So that, I'm sure you probably found both. Oh yeah. Yourself. And you see us fighting a few times, um, <laughs> but if you overall, two months, I would be surprised. Then it's strange. <laughs> yeah, overall, I think when you effectively like take turns saving each other's lives, literally saving each other's lives, it's a bond. It's a pretty unbreakable bond. Not that we, you know, we were already bonded for life as siblings, but this was a very special, unique uh, bond that I have no interest in repeating. No interest in doing something like that again, but I'm glad I I'm glad it's behind me. I'm glad that we had that shared experience. There you go. When I have some time, I'm going to watch the whole series, and I recommend you guys do too because it looks amazing. Just the clips I saw. Let's go into business now a bit. I mean, you didn't start off with your own company. You were in consulting for a while. Talk about the draws of that and what made it so it wasn't that much fun when you had the opportunity to open your own business. What did you think of the consulting business? Well, I, yeah, I think consulting is a great way to learn a lot of skills and uh, whether they're analytical skills, whether it's client relationship skills, which is important, you know, in a lot of different contexts and uh, hard skills, soft skills to, you know, working in teams, how to design a project, build a project. Like it's, it, it's a very uh, broadly applicable foundation. Ultimately, though, I'm, I'm a passionate person. I'm very passionate about the things I do. And I realized as soon as I started Explore Cold Brew, it just felt like something clicked. I was like, oh, yes, this is what I'm meant to be doing. I love just pouring myself into my whatever I'm doing. In this case, my company, I, it, it's been, it feels like it's been almost like my entire life for the last three years since I started the business. And so love, you know, I, I loved being a consultant you know, and I, I loved everything I learned from that, but it does not compare to run, you know, owning and running my own business and being able to, you know, on Thanksgiving, for example, 
I, gosh, I was feeling a little bit emotional because, you know, my family was together and I was just grateful for the time and I was grateful to be running my business and all that. And, and so I sent an email to, to all 70,000 people on our email list for my company. And I, I didn't proofread. I didn't write, I hadn't drafted it out in advance. It was just sort of a stream of, not stream of consciousness. That makes it sound like unhinged. It was like, it was a, it was a thank, it was an, it was a thank you note to my customers and, and even people who hadn't purchased, but were just on our list, just saying, thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And it means a lot to me to have you on this journey with me. And, and I got so many responses to that directly, you know, and then I've responded to those and I had, I, I mean, I love talking with our customers, but it's just, it's, it's nice to feel like I'm building something that is enhancing people's lives. In our case, it's a delicious cold brew product, delicious chai products that, you know, for example, our decaf product, our decaf customers are obsessed because they don't, they don't get decaf cold brew anywhere else. They can't get decaf cold brew elsewhere. And so I'm very grateful to have Explore cold brew in my life. I love that. And I think it's so important. You work the hardest you ever worked, but it's the most gratifying. I mean, you're exhausted at the end of the day, but you look back on it and it's like, wow, we did that though. So that's awesome. I love that. Talk about how Cold Brew decided to be the business idea. Tell me how the, what was the impetus behind it and what made this the business of choice? Well, so it, it, I didn't set out to create a cold brew company or to even create a coffee company. In fact, I wouldn't have categorized myself previously as a big co- – now I'm definitely a coffee, big coffee drinker, coffee addict, cold brew addict specifically. But at the time, it was the early days of the pandemic, and it was more an issue of insomnia because – just that one or two coffees I was having each day, if I had one in the afternoon, I'd be up all night. And at the time, like when I was, I was in my apartment in Brooklyn, there was nothing else to do except to drink coffee and work. And so I, I couldn't help myself, but drink it later and later. And finally, my husband was like, Hazen, please switch to decaf. Like, please. And I looked for decaf cold brew and it didn't exist. And I was like, wait, 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 you're telling me that 10% of coffee cups consumed in the United States are decaf, and yet there's no decaf cold brew at all, and yet there wasn't. So I was like, well, I need I need this for myself, and it's just crazy. I also don't want just decaf. I want a low caffeine. I want a regular caffeine. I want an extra caffeine. I want to be able to choose a caffeine level that fits that day, that fits my needs. You know, on a Friday night, I need the most caffeinated, like, yeah, I'm up early on a Friday, and then if my friends are like, oh, let's go out dancing tonight, it's like, give me the most caffeinated because I'm going to need every every single milligram of caffeine to have the energy to to go out the Friday night. Um, whereas, you know, other times I need that that half calf, just a little bit of a nudge. And uh, and so that was the, the very organic impetus for starting Explore Cold Brew. I think it's a brilliant idea, like you said, you, and that's the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. You find a niche that hasn't been served, and you, you try to find ways to fill it. And so what was it like? I mean, the coffee business is not a very – it's not a non-competitive field. We'll put it that way. There's definitely some competitors out there. What was the learning curve like to kind of uh, to get there? You know, you know you have a product that you know is going to be popular because it's not done – but how did you go about your research and how did you go about learning the business? I think that I'd learned how to do market research from my time as a consultant. So I did the you know quantitative and analytical side of understanding the market, understanding the competitors, the landscape, et cetera. And yeah, there it's a competitive space, but I did believe, and I still believe that coming in with this unique offering of caffeine level being the main uh, the, the main differentiator was and remains powerful and and differentiated compared to our competitors. That said, I, I mean, look, it's it's a competitive space. I would say that my recommendation to other people would be be wary <laughs> when you have a lot of very entrenched, well funded competitors. It's still it's it's a real challenge. Um, but the uh, the other side of it though is you can only get so far with analytics. I think you have to, you do have to use your gut and you have to 
gut check for yourself. Is this something I'm genuinely passionate about? Because there's so, I mean, there's, there's highs and lows, but there's a lot of lows and it's very easy. If you're not uniquely passionate about your product, your idea, your business, it is way too easy in those lows to be like, why am I doing this? So I'd say like, there, do, do your market research, but also do, do your gut check and make sure that you'll be able to push through and stick, at, stick it out even when going gets tough. Good advice. Well, on that note, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the things you've created here. We're going to stick together a couple of videos and let the listeners see. This is the amazing Explorer Cold Brew Coffee Company by my very special guest today, Mr. Case and Crane. We'll talk about it on the other side. Be back in a couple of seconds. Here we All right, that was Explorer Cold Brew with my very special guest today. Mr. Case and Crane is here. Case and wow. I mean, and I got to say, I, I, I've done a lot of research on the company. I looked at it. The packaging, the old packaging sucked wind, my friend. I got to tell you, you should be excited. <laughs> this new packaging is amazing. The product was already amazing. But talk about um, bringing it all together. How does this fuel the creative side of you? We talked before in the video about the business side. Talk about the creative side for you. How does that bring it out in you? Well, I mean, as someone who does not identify as a particularly creative person, it's a great way for me as a creative outlet because, uh, you know, I can, well, I, I, I'm able to work with people who are way more capable and smarter and, and talented than I am. And I'm able to communicate a vision I have and then see it come to life. A great example of this is our beautiful new branding. Our legacy branding, I did it myself because I didn't have the funds for a graphic designer or a branding agency or anything like that. I, and I, I'm not a graphic designer, as you can see. And honestly, to have had that legacy branding get us to millions of dollars in sales is a testament to how strong our product is because I don't think anyone was buying it based on the branding. <laughs> but our new branding finally evokes the spirit, the explorer spirit and ethos I was originally going for and speaks to the quality of what's actually inside the bottle, which is extremely high quality coffee, all organic, fair trade, specialty grade coffee. And I worked with an amazing, amazing uh, branding agency named Truffle, Rafael Ferrasat, who's also, uh, he's also queer. So love that. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. that's a great example of how like I was able to, we, it was, it was almost like therapy where like it was these very intense, long Q and a interviews to just get to the, the deep meaning and spirit of, of what it means to be an explorer. What I want out of this brand, what do I want people to think and feel when they see it, when they sip it, et cetera. And, and then for Raphael and his team to create the incredible, incredible, beautiful, elevated, packaging that we now have. I, it, it's just a great example of how that is a creative outlet to me. Even though I didn't do any of that design, I feel like I am a part of it. <laughs> so. Well, your fingers are in it. Yeah, they have to go on your design. I was in marketing for three years, owned my own company. And like I said, the first part, you had the product. The product was there. It was a niche product. It wasn't there before. And the only thing that I saw with the old packaging is it's busy. People tend to put all the information they can into stuff, right? And so you just had a lot of information that kind of, you need that white space, which you have now in the pack. And you have the beautiful design, the lines, everything. And it, I mean, the product is the product. The product is amazing. All the, all the bells and whistles on the outside doesn't change how good the product is. But I think you learn things as you go along. And like you said, you're in that process. And I think that's so great. And ta did you always have these ancillary things? Now you have these great elixirs for mood. I'm getting, that's what I'm going to be ordering. I'm going to be ordering a lot of the elixirs. Talk about yeah, so that was, how they came about. 
Well, we so we developed we started with just the cold brew concentrates, and then now we have this sort of broader product suite. We've got the premium flavor syrups, functional elixirs, we have chai and dirty chai concentrates. And the idea behind the product suite was it was really inspired by our customers. In my customer interviews, they kept saying they kept referring to their explorer as like their at home barista experience. And when I asked them what they wanted, they they said they wanted a, an even more complete at home barista experience. I found that most of my customers were drinking their cold brew sweetened, which is why we introduced the flavor, the flavor syrups. I drink my cold brew black, but ultimately, even if I'm my own biggest customer, I'm very attuned to what my customers want, how they're drinking it, et cetera. So those were really born out of customer feedback and it's been great. I mean, from a, both, a, from both a sort of appeal basis and also from a, business on a business basis, like being able to have a customer, uh, buy both cold brew and a, to buy a cold brew and a flavor syrup in one package, it helps. It just, it helps with the order economics tremendously because shipping is such a big cost of our, uh, it's a big cost for us. So when you buy two bottles, our shipping cost on like a per unit basis goes way down. Um, because it's like nine and a half dollars versus 10 and a half dollars, whether you're shipping, like it, Shipping is crazy. That's a whole other tangent. Not gonna but the, the gist of it is that that was the thinking behind the um, the product suite. And again, I think it it just further differentiates us. Like other cold brew companies would just have introduced flavored concentrates. For us, we want to put you in charge. We want you to add as much or as little of that flavor sweetness as you as you desire. So um, it's. I, I think it's great. It's really a very popular gift in the holiday season. People love being able to send folks their explore. We've got these beautiful boxes. And um, so, yeah, I, I love it. It's brilliant marketing. And like you said, I think the concept behind is what's really smart because like I said, some people are coffee purists. I'm the kind of person that likes a little coffee with my cream. Some people like a little, a uh, little cream in their coffee. Some like it black. When you have that flavor profile, and you can kind of experiment it. I, I experiment with beans all the time. I'm a home grinder. I'm usually a hot coffee guy, so I'll put different flavored beans into the filters and grind it together. So it's great to have that customizable experience. Plus, save yourself money and the time when you can package these things. And I love your subscription service. I think that's very smart. I think it's very um, now in marketing. Talk about that as well. That's a, a great. Well, this, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm so grateful for our subscribers. Those are our true like explorer diehard customers. And those are the people that, that like they, they can't live without their explorer. Um, and I'm very grateful for them. I, yeah, I mean, I, I for years I did every single Every single customer service interaction, email, phone call, text message, Instagram DM, every single one I responded to. Now I have an amazing woman named Susan. She and I uh, tag team it. But um, I have had so many awesome conversations with those subscribers. So I'm very grateful to them. It's definitely a great, it's the best deal in terms of the price you're getting on Explorer. And for folks who are regular Explore drinkers, I mean, it's, it's on, it's on people. And now you can subscribe and save on Amazon as well. So we're on Amazon, we're on our website. Yeah. So, um, our products are on subscribe and save there. So it's, we, you know, we're trying to do everything. We're trying to meet customers where they are for a long time, for two and a half years, we were only online, only on our website, only on Amazon. But then I realized like, look, as much as I want everyone to buy their cold brew online, most people still buy it in the grocery store. So over the last few months, we've started getting to the grocery store. We're in almost 300 grocery stores across the country right now with another few hundred uh, in the next six weeks. Uh, and then, you know, more in the pipeline beyond that. Um, so we have a store locator on our website. You can find us in person if you are going to shop at the grocery store. Um, and if you do take a picture and send it to me because it helps to see like where it's merchandise. It's these little things that I didn't think about before I started Explore, but like, just how it's placed on the shelf, where in the store it's placed. I don't have full visibility into that. So if you go out and buy some Explorer, take a photo, send it to Kaysen at explorecolber.com. That's my personal email. And, uh, and I very much appreciate it. That's amazing. I love that. Now talk about, speaking of marketing, let's talk about being featured in a little Choice of On video. I found that absolutely amazing. How did that come about? So 
you know, I, my jokey answer to that is, is the gay mafia. <laughs> um, but I, I think one thing that's been really important to me in Explorer has been running the company as a, as an out and proud individual and wanting the business to also embody that spirit of pride. So we've done a lot of, uh, we've, we've donated through the business uh, a lot to the Trevor Project and other LGBT organizations, but I wanted our partnerships to grow. And uh, this fall, I sort of set out to make that a priority. So through a mutual friend, I got connected to Troy's team. He is such a sweetheart and really cares about LGBT businesses and supporting other LGBT businesses. So um, that was how I got connected to Troy. We also are, if you know, Matt Rogers, the comedian, um, we're in yeah. his, uh, also it's Christmas video, which is hilarious. It's a great song. It's hilarious. Um, we also, there's another one that I can't mention yet in that'll, you'll see in the next couple of weeks that is another nice. queer artist. We also were, uh, we, we partnered with Orville Peck at his Pioneer Town Rodeo. Um, we're also sponsoring a queer um, and gender inclusive uh, cycling team here in New York uh, starting wow. this upcoming season. So like, you know, I think like that it's, I think that running a, a a business with pride is in some ways harder than just living a life with pride. I don't know if there's as much like benefit from a business perspective, but from a values standpoint, I, I think it's a, it's just a non-negotiable for me. I think so too. And I think it's something with the community supports community, right? And so you get the word out there and they understand that, and that that's a whole cycle in and of itself. And, and you've done it to everything. I mean, you're, you're a chief, um, is towards water, I think, which is fantastic that you're supporting water. That's very important. And so you need to have that balance, right, with a little bit of everything. Talk about what got you with the water project. Well, so, so the, yeah, so in addition to all of our queer collaborations and, and give back programs, we also give back percentage sales to Charity Water, which is an amazing organization providing access to clean water to people all over the world. And for, for me, this was born out of a this realization that I felt like I couldn't live without coffee. And I had this moment where I was like, wait, that's, that statement is so extreme. There are people in the world who literally cannot live because they do not have access to clean water. And so as part of our giving back and our efforts to, you know, operate a, a company with a clear mission orientation, it felt like an amazing no, you know, amazing partnership that just sort of a no brainer and it complements our sustainability efforts. You know, the, the fact that we are making a concentrate that is itself, you know, you're fitting a lot more servings into one bottle. You're reducing the ship, the shipping emissions, you're reducing the, the materials used, the packaging materials used, et cetera. These are all sustainable, sustainable choices. And, you know, we're doing other things. We're offsetting all of our shipping emissions. We're composting all of our coffee grounds, things like that. But, um, I think it just all fits together with our mission and sustainability orientation. That is amazing. We got to start wrapping it up. What is uh, ahead for you? Is there anything that's on the horizon that you're allowed to speak about now or anything you're excited about or just kind of getting through the holiday season? We're going to give your web address so people can order in time for the holidays here soon. But what's, what's in store next for uh, Explorer, Cold Brew, and for Kaysen? Well, Scott, you know, <laughs> What I love about running my own business is that I don't, I don't have an answer to that because every day, every week brings a new challenge, a new opportunity, a new hurdle we have to overcome. And so I'd say I'm excited to go into each day ready to take it on as a new adventure. I love it. And last question for you, Kaysen, how are you finding it able to do a balance between adventure caisson and entrepreneur caisson? Are you able to find that balance? Is it a little more difficult now? Talk about that. Luckily, I find that going on adventures is, it's like, I would just as, I, I mean, I, I would rather go on an adventure than go on a vacation, if, if that makes sense. So for me, it doesn't really feel like a trade-off. I think I'm not looking to go starve in the Alaskan wilderness again for two months, but, <laughs> you know, my husband and I just did Ironman Arizona last weekend going into the Thanksgiving 
uh, and going to Thanksgiving week. And I think other people would view that as a chore, whereas I view it as, as a fun activity, you know, I mean, <laughs> spending 11 hours exercising in the hot sun is, I guess it's not everyone's definition of fun, but I found it fun. So I, you know, there's, I think we try and combine our, if we're going to go on a vacation, trying to find some sort of adventure, whether it's in a race or some other challenge, a hike or trek. Um, so I, I, and the other thing, honestly, like one of the great perks of, yes, I work every single day, like every single day of the week, I do some work. Maybe it's a, only a few hours. Maybe it's a full day. Maybe it's an all nighter. You never like every day is different. Saturdays and Sundays included, but I have the flexibility. I can work remotely. I can set my own hours. If I want to work from, you know, 6 a.m. to noon, or if I want to work from noon to midnight, like I, I can be flexible in that way. So I think actually, I don't feel a great tension between the business and going on adventures. That's great. Well, Case and Crane, it's been amazing having you on. Congratulations on all the success of the business, of these fantastic adventures you're going on. I'm so happy that you and your husband have that niche. That was going to be one of my questions to see how he fit into all this. And it sounds like you guys are definitely the match made in heaven. Let everyone know where they can find your website. Like I said, so you have time to order for the holidays here and in general. And where they can follow you on social media, my friend. Great. Yeah. Our website is explorecoldbrew.com. So you can buy there. You can buy on Amazon if you prefer faster shipping. Um, although the packaging is going to be different, obviously. So if you're getting it as a gift, go to our website. Uh, and then on Instagram, I'm at Case and Crane, C A S O N C R A N E. And we're at Explore Cold Brew. Fantastic. Stay on the line for me, my <laughs> Guys, we have a special five question with Case on next Tuesday. So be sure to look for that. We appreciate y'all listening. We hope we're having a happy holiday season so far with love, loved ones and friends. We'll be back next week uh, right here on the Left of Straight Show. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five-star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website, www.leftofstraightradio.com for contests and other news and information. See you next week.